So we know a lot of movies are based off books. Harry Potter, Twilight, Dune, Hunger Games, Lord of the Rings, Little Women, Crazy Rich Asians, just to name a few. And most of the time those movies are known that they're based off books because their books are just as popular as the movie. But there's some stories that get so popular as movies that people don't even realize that they were based off books. So I wanted to do this video to read some stories in their original format, whether or not I've seen their adaptation. Quick disclaimer, I know there will probably be some or a lot of you who did know that these books exist, but I also know these movies are not as connected to their books or the fact that they're adaptations, so I just thought this would be fun. First book that I'm gonna be reading in this video is gonna be Psycho by Robert Block. This is actually the only one that I'm like planning to read that I genuinely didn't know existed. Like I didn't know Psycho was based off of a book. I just thought it was like Alfred Hitchcock's mind. But apparently like all of Alfred Hitchcock's movies are based off something. I only found out about this one while I was researching other books because I know a few movies like the other books that I plan to read in this video. I knew that they were books but like I found that out at some point and was surprised because it's not like people talk about them as books. Like it's not known as much that they were books, but this one I really didn't know. But like I said, I think all of Alfred Hitchcock's movies were based off books. The only Alfred Hitchcock movies that I've seen are Vertigo and The Birds. I've been wanting to watch Psycho for so long because it's like iconic and because Bates Motel is actually one of my favorite shows. So I know the story pretty well because the movie's like very well known, but also because I watched all of Bates Motel and I think the last season is technically like the events of Psycho. I did start this already, so I'm 50 pages in and it's short. This is a very short book. It's only 170 pages, so it's kind of more like a novella, but I feel like those are the best adaptations because there's not too much content. So there doesn't have to be a lot of stuff cut. So like the flow of the story still works. So I did start this and I'm planning to read a bit more of it. And I have to say, I'm actually liking it quite a bit so far. I think I like um, this guy's writing. So this book came out in 1959 and then the movie came out in 1960. Apparently this was like a popular book and then Alfred Hitchcock obviously read it, enjoyed it, wanted to adapt it into a movie. But like really everything, every bit of marketing is the classic that spawned the movie. Alfred Hitchcock quote is on the front like saying that like Psycho all came from this guy, which obviously it all came from this book. I'm 50 pages in. Like I said, I'm enjoying it and I'm excited to read more of it. The story is just like very iconic and honestly like so well put together. Just the story of Norman Bates. I guess I could explain. I just assume because it's so well known that like everyone knows what this is, but this is about Norman Bates who he and his mother own a motel called the Bates Motel. That's their last name. His mother is like not well and he and his mother have a very strained relationship. He's 40 years old. He's never left home. He's never gotten a job for himself. He's never been married. He's never had any relationship with any women. He's never made relationships of his own. Like he's just only ever been under the care of his mother and worked at the motel. Like he has no prospects in life besides this, besides taking care of his mother, taking care of the motel. And then a woman checks in one night and some stuff happens and his mother is a little very much unwell in the head so she does some things that are a little questionable i know like i said everything from this so i know the twist i know how it goes like i don't know that i need to talk around spoilers but like i don't want to just be spilling the beans of the story but i will say it's interesting to read it from the beginning and like know everything and like hear the way that certain things are happening or like read certain scenes see the way they're set up and be like i know what this is avoiding doing because i know what is actually happening i'll, I'll probably just finish it and then that'll be the next time i update you because i don't think there's gonna be much for me to like say wow guys it's the next day it's the next morning actually and i finished psycho <laughs> This is exciting for two reasons, because I feel like I haven't really been sucked into a book this much in a bit. Like, it's been a while. First of all, it's very short. So like, the pacing is really fast. Stuff happens very fast. I also was surprised at how much I didn't know this story followed. I felt like I could picture the Alfred Hitchcock movie running through my head, even though I haven't seen it yet, as it was going along. Because everything about this feels so Hitchcock even though he didn't write it but it like matches his style and it makes so much sense why he would pick this up and want to make a movie of it and it like I could just see his movie already like the dialogue the characters the way things were moving like it just makes so much sense things that I was surprised about I didn't realize how many other characters there were there were in this story and how much that goes into the story I guess like how many other people we follow because as I mentioned like it's about Norman Bates at the Bates Hotel but it's also about the woman who 
did I even mention this? Who steals money, she's on the run, she's going to meet up with her boyfriend, but she didn't tell anyone her plan, and she stays a night in the motel, and then she's killed. She's the shower scene, she's the iconic shower scene. That only happens about 50 pages into the book. So like, very early, which I was kind of surprised about, because I didn't really know the order of events or like how quickly these things happen in the movie, but I just know the gist of the story. Then we follow other characters like the boyfriend and then the sister who is looking for her. So it's them trying to figure out what happened and the Bates Motel is like close to where the boyfriend is. So like that is important. And there's another guy on the lookout for her as well. I think I'm giving this four stars. I thought it was just like a really easy read. First of all, I saw when I was looking up stuff about like Alfred Hitchcock adaptations and like the fact that all of his movies are adaptations. I saw someone say that like, his movies are less well known that they're adaptations because he adapts like lowbrow media, lowbrow books. I just really enjoyed this. Like I think the setup of the story was so good. The fact that there's so many references to this book, like this book is where some references all began. Sam Loomis is the name of the boyfriend of Mary Crane, which her name's Marion in the movie. Don't know why that was changed, but Sure. Mary Crane's boyfriend's name is Sam Loomis. Halloween, John Carpenter, oh my God. That's, that's the other reference I was looking for. John Carpenter, the Halloween movies, the iconic Halloween movies, you know, uh, what's his name, Michael Myers, Jamie Lee Curtis, you know? The doctor in that, his name is Dr. Loomis. which is a reference to Psycho the movie because the movie is the one that blew up like these characters, these names. So Dr. Loomis in Halloween is a reference to Psycho the movie, but Scream, directed by Wes Craven, Billy Loomis is the main, the boyfriend of Sidney Prescott. Loomis is a reference to Halloween, which is a reference to Psycho, which was adapted from this book. And then last but not least, the new Scream movies with the new characters, the main character is Sam Carpenter, who is the daughter of Billy Loomis. Sam. Loomis. She's technically Sam Loomis. And then Sam Carpenter is a reference to John Carpenter from Halloween. So all of these things reference each other. So all of these things come back to this book from 1959. This little book that people don't even really realize exists. Like this guy, Robert Block, no one knows his name. This guy is the reason for all of these Loomis chains throughout horror. And that's just so fun. So first book is done. I'm honestly so glad I read this. I really, really enjoyed it. I'd be down to read more of his books, potentially, just because they're really easy and I feel like he has a good grasp of plot. So now let's talk about the next book I'm going to be reading, which I haven't started yet, so I'm just going to intro it really quickly. Next book that I plan to read, which I'm a little nervous for because this is actually the longest of the books that I have chosen, and I also feel like it'll be a little bit more of a complicated one, but that is Jurassic Park by Michael, how do you say his last name? Crichton? Crichton? Crick, Crick, I think this is probably the book or the adaptation that is most well known that it is a book, even though it's, I think, a lesser known adaptation that came from a book. This one I think is pretty well known. It's also definitely the most read, at least on Goodreads, and at least with like a new audience today, like the audiences today. This is also more recent, but yeah, like I said, this one's the longest. This is like 448 pages, it looks like. 448 pages, so definitely a longer one. I think it's gonna be more complicated. What time is it? Because I have to go. Yeah, I have to go, I have to, go to work. I'm working today. A little bit more complicated plot to follow because it has to do with a lot of science. This definitely is like a sci-fi thriller or horror. So I'm interested to get into this, but a little nervous. And I may try to start it today during my lunch, maybe tonight, but like I work at a restaurant and I work for 11 hours straight on my feet. So I'm usually pretty tired when I get home and then I only have like a 30 minute break. So I eat during that time. So we'll see if I get into this today, maybe tomorrow, even though I'm working tomorrow as well. And then maybe Monday, but I do also have plans Monday, but I want to get into this because I also want to see how I feel about this. I have seen Jurassic Park, but I think only like once. I'll let you know when I get into this. Okay, it's only the next day already and I'm almost 100 pages into Jurassic Park, which I'm pretty impressed about because I worked yesterday and I'm working today. I'm about to leave in a couple minutes again. I mean, I think I was like 30 pages in only this morning and I'm on page 94 right now, but I started the book yesterday on my break. There's the prologue, which was really good. It was basically just like someone was attacked by one of the dinosaurs and like he needs a doctor, but they're not saying that that's what happened. So the doctor's like, that, that this, this, this injury doesn't look like he was just like crushed by some 
vehicle or something that looks like he was literally mauled by something and obviously he was but now i'm on page 94 and they're already at jurassic park it's good like it's good like his writing is good the premise is good obviously the premise is good but like the setup of everything is so good and the introduction of the different characters and like the slow unfolding of the dinosaurs like being cloned and being brought back by this freaking dinosaur nut old rich man it's good and i am enjoying it like i'm finding that it is pretty engaging and i i don't know if i mentioned this, this is kind of the book that i was the most nervous about that this one would be one that i have to push myself through because it is a pretty long book so it's possible that there will still be moments that will like drag later on it's definitely good and like seeing the little hints of the dinosaurs now they all know that this is what he's done because they're at Jurassic Park. So they see that there are dinosaurs, living dinosaurs. And I will probably let you know when I'm like halfway through. This book is so freaking good. I'm not halfway through yet. I know I said I was gonna update when I was halfway through, but I just wanted to hop in here really quickly. Hopefully it'll actually be quickly. I'm on page 188 and just like, it's so crazy the concept of this book. So. Obviously, you probably know what Jurassic Park is about. Like, it's about this million billionaire guy who decides to make a park and clone or create dinosaur life again and basically just make this zoo amusement park thing called Jurassic Park where the dinosaurs live. But the setting of the book is him inviting paleontologists, botanists, experts in the field of dinosaurs. Not all experts in the field of dinosaurs. We follow Grant and Dr. Sattler, I think is her name, Ellie. They're the two who like really know about dinosaurs and like the prehistoric Jurassic eras. They're knowledgeable in that. So I think they have like research funded by Hammond, who's the wealthy guy who created the park. But there's also Malcolm, who's a, he's like a math guy. He's like statistics stuff like that like he knows numbers but these are all people who like have been contacted by Hammond are investors some of them are investors some of them have gotten help from Hammond I don't know stuff like that I love that we're seeing this park pre opening like they talk about the things that are unfinished yet they're like this is gonna be included later but this is just like a tour of the park the first people who are not working on the park are now seeing it and it's just crazy how stupid they are in the construction of this park. Like they're just dumb. And it's interesting to see the people who are coming in and like are able to call out the mistakes that they're making because they're so much more knowledgeable or also just being like a new eye looking at the park. And it's just really good. Like this is, this is a really good book. Like it's really good, it's super slay. So I'm gonna keep reading and then. <laughs> updates let me give you some foresight that's not the word i want at all some context for where we are right now it is now monday i think the last time i you saw me was thursday when i was reading jurassic park i ended up finishing it that night i finished it like around midnight thursday night and then friday i started editing this video and then i had plans with my friends but i finished jurassic park thursday night and I really, really liked it. I loved the adventure aspect of it, but also it just felt so, so much deeper than that as well. Like it wasn't just a very surface level action adventure kind of story, which I didn't like necessarily think it was. It's why it works so well. It's why it's so popular or why it's kind of maintained its position in pop culture. The characters were good. They were all like really interesting to follow and I liked the different parts they played within the story. I'm giving you like such a great sale for this book. 
Michael Crichton, I'll say the big thing is he really knows how, how to build suspense. And that's what I really enjoyed. Like he kept me captivated throughout a 450 practically page book. Like I really, I thought I would be a little bored at some parts, but I wasn't. There were no moments that I was like, okay, this is dragging, let's move on to the next thing. Like I don't really think there were any moments like that. That's kind of what I was worried about with this because I thought it would be a lot of, not hard words, but I thought it would be a little bit more difficult to get through because it's a bit like more complicated writings and stuff like that, but it's not. It's not. It's actually very easy. I think it's a very like accessible for a like large audience. And I'm excited to rewatch Jurassic Park. I probably might be a bit nitpicky with certain things that are changed because I think that the way the events unfolded in this book were really well done. And the way this ended made me want to read the sequel. I have been debating between a four and a five, like four and five stars for this book. The thing is, I really don't have any complaints about it. Also, I'm matching. I'm literally matching the book. That's actually crazy. My hair is the dinosaur. My skin is the background. We won't talk about how pale I am. And my lips are the red accents. They're besties. I really can't decide. I gave it four stars on Goodreads after finishing it just cause I was like, I don't, it's not like a new favorite book or anything like that, but I thought it was really good. So I don't know, maybe it's just like a 4.5, but I really didn't have any complaints with it. So I kind of feel like it is five stars. So I have three avenues of reading of this book. Like I have literally three copies of this book in this hand because I don't know why. I put a hold on the library a while ago, like when I was starting this video, in case I would want to read it on my Kindle. I have been reading it on my Kindle, but that's also because I worked this weekend. So, you know, I was running around all weekend in that restaurant, but I was able to get some reading in. I put both of these on a hold at the library. So let me actually intro this next book. The next book is Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption by Stephen King. So this is the movie that I know the most out of these three. So I like have seen it a couple times. Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption started as a short story by Stephen King, obviously, and it was a originally published in this short story collection called Different Seasons and each short story was supposed to represent different seasons and Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption was the first one which is categorized as Hope Springs Eternal. This is a big boy and I really got this for no reason and now I could just use it to show you. This is how Shawshank was originally published and then I saw that just the story on its own was available in my library's like system. So I also put that on hold. So I've been reading between this and this. Like I said, this is a short story. This is short story novella kind of, it's 111 pages is like the actual page count. And I've read majority of it over this weekend. I've kind of been reading it slowly because 111 pages, I could have read that really quickly, but I started it Saturday morning and then, yeah, now it's Monday morning. So I'm on page 80 now. I found it a bit hard to get into this, despite it, first of all, being so short. I think the writing is obviously good. Like Stephen King is a talented writer and I will say Stephen King is a talented story creator. The stories he comes up with are so interesting. Like I've never read anything else Stephen King. I've seen some of his things. I've seen it. I've seen The Shining. I've seen Shawshank. The story he comes up with are undeniably really good. This story I think is amazing. I think the movie is spectacular. Classic, like literally like a perfect movie. It's so amazing. Starting this book, my mind was really drifting throughout certain parts and I kind of found it hard to really get into it, which I thought would happen to me with Jurassic Park. Like I thought I'd be sitting, reading it and just kind of looking at the words rather than actually reading it. But no, I was really engrossed in Jurassic Park. But this one, I kind of would find my mind wandering. And I think it's something about Stephen King's writing where he kind of takes you on a journey in each sentence. Like I was gonna say each paragraph, but each sentence, he kind of like strings you along through something. And I'm like, where are you taking me? Where are we going right now? And I found that I was just getting lost in those sentences. I don't think it's complicated and it's not, it wasn't that deep. Like I was able to get through, I've been able to get through the book, but this has just been the one that has had my mind wander the most while reading it, but I think that's been rectified. And then the last thing that I was thinking is there's just like this arrogance in Stephen King's writing where he like knows he's good. So he's just like flexing that. It's weird to say that. Cause it's like, obviously if someone's a good writer, then they're a good writer and they 
kind of know it in some way because why else would they be writing what they're writing i don't know it just felt like he was really like look at these things i'm coming up with because okay i did not give a synopsis for this at all rita hayworth and shawshank redemption is about this guy named red who is imprisoned in shawshank he's there for murdering his wife and like some other people which were kind of like accidental and then this guy named Andy Dufresne who was convicted for the murder of his wife and her lover but he's innocent but he has been sentenced to life it's about red and and Andy's not the main character but he also kind of is because the story's like really about him but also of course it's about red I think it is a very interesting choice to have red be the narrator and I think it works for the story and it works for the movie a lot like Morgan Freeman narration obviously iconic red in this is supposed to be irish and like white and red haired that's why he's called red morgan freeman is not white or red haired but he is the perfect casting and i can't i can't picture not morgan freeman as red red being the narrator i think works for the story for the most part but i also think there are some things that kind of make it suffer a little i'll get to that but with red being the narrator he talks about things with andy and like the way he carries himself is different from all the other prisoners because he just has this feeling of like optimism almost where he just carries himself differently from the other prisoners who have like accepted the fact that this is their life and this is going to be forever for them and he just doesn't really have that the beginning of this book really sets up like all of these moments where andy proves himself to be really different from the other inmates and he stands up for himself and he does a lot of things that other people won't do and it just sets him apart from the other prisoners in shawshank and the thing about that is it just feels like Stephen King came up with all of these super badass guy things for him to do while he's in prison to like show like I'm not like you other prisoners and that sounds so reductive to the story but it just felt that way that's like the weird arrogance that I felt while reading this where he's like look at this character I came up with isn't he really cool I, I don't know that kind of set me off weird in the beginning of the book he's not wrong like he's not wrong he came up with some really cool stuff and the story's amazing while i was reading at work yesterday the scene that i did sit down and read turned me around i find that i'm definitely more invested andy gets information from a new inmate at shawshank that there's someone who said that he killed a woman and her lover and that the woman's husband is convicted for the crime and the details are very specific to andy's situation and he is like so determined to get this figured out and get this corrected but it doesn't go the way he wants it to and this is the moment that i think really changed the story and changed the way andy is portrayed that i really appreciate seeing his desperation and kind of seeing him break down in this way made him a more real character all of my complaints or kind of issues in the beginning were rectified a little bit with that moment i'm gonna finish this and then we will wrap up this video it's already happening oh my god Obviously I finished it. <laughs> I don't even know if I should talk now or if I should wait. Sorry, you're like on books because I put you on my desk. Oh my God. I, I don't even know if I cried watching the movie. So Stephen King is really good. That was actually like insane. So I'm just kind of gonna talk spoilers here. I, I don't even know if that's considered like spoilers like most people have seen this movie so you at least know the story and even if you haven't seen the movie i feel like the plot or the end the twist or i don't it's like not even a twist but like the end of the movie and like andy's fate is well known but i'm just gonna let you know in case you literally don't know anything about the story and want to go into it blind like skip 
to hear when I just wrap up everything. When Red first says that Andy escaped, I was like, that's, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm just blocking my face. That's how we're saying it. And we still had like 20, less than 30 pages left in the book. So I was like, I thought it was gonna be closer to the end. And it's just this one little like, paragraph section where he says it. There's not like any build up to it, which I guess the whole book is build up to this moment, but I wasn't sure how I felt about that. And then he starts explaining what happened when they find his cell block empty and then them trying to find him, trying to figure out how he could have disappeared. And then they rip off the poster. And then he thinks back on how Andy would have been able to do it when he would have started thinking back on like the moments that he remembers most with Andy what sticks out to him and how that possibly where that fit in the timeline of him deciding to break out deciding to scrape and hammer into the wall of his cell and that was all well and good and I enjoyed that I don't actually remember when I started crying this story being and I saw people saying this when I was looking up just the short story collection. This story obviously fits exactly, like no question, for the Hope Springs Eternal section of different seasons. Like this whole entire story, oh my god, is about hope and about like perseverance. And it's also like Red says, okay, there we go. It's also like Red says something that some people have and some people don't. And it's like, that's it. You just have it or you don't. And Andy had it. It's so crazy because like I know that's like the message of the story and I knew that was the whole thing. But actually reading it, Jesus Christ. And I like know all of this. Like I literally knew all of this. Like I see the movie in my head. I remember obviously everything. Like I knew the story and I know the way it ends with like Red getting out and him trying to find the spot where Andy's key to his new life was. And I know like the way everything goes and I'm gonna hate looking over this footage but god this end is crazy like it's only a 111 page story and throughout even like 80 pages of it even though I knew the story and I know I like the story I still wasn't that into it or I still wasn't that taken by it like I just wasn't I obviously appreciated what Stephen King was doing in the story Red's character, Andy's character, obviously. The whole plot, like, I knew it was good, but oh my god, did that ending hit entirely different than the movie or than I was just expecting because I was how I was feeling throughout the whole book. Oh my god, I like wish this was my copy because I need to like point out the specific moments or like underline the specific moments that just like really did it for me. Okay, yeah. One of the moments that really got me, I think I think I was crying a little bit, but what really hit was when he said that he got a postcard from Texas with nothing on it. And he knew, <laughs> oh my God. Uh, and he knew that that was where Andy would have crossed to Mexico. He got him such a basic freaking bitch. Now I'm like, okay, now I have to read Stephen King. <laughs> Red says that he's been like, writing this whole thing down. It's like a memoir manuscript kind of thing. And I, oh my God, I love this part because I was thinking it where he says, um, oh yeah, he says, writing about yourself seems to be a lot like sticking a branch into clear river water and roiling up the muddy bottom. And then in like italics it says, well, you weren't writing about yourself. I hear someone in the peanut gallery saying, you were writing about Andy Dufresne. You're nothing but a minor character in your own story. Oh God. <laughs> okay, that hits a little bit different. Okay, initially I was just like, yeah, that's literally what I was thinking. Like, the story's about Andy. But it obviously is still such a smart choice to have Red be the narrator. To have it not just be Andy telling his story. Because also, I think that goes against Andy's character. To be telling his story, like, he just wants to be a free man. Oh my god! Anyway, Morgan Freeman, he wants to be a free man. But Red telling the story, I need to get it together. <laughs> Red telling the story just gives it a totally different, like, feeling, but also really hammers, pun intended, not really, I didn't mean to, hammers down, hammers in <laughs> the point of the story of, like, hope and living your life and, like, calling himself a minor character in his own story. And, like, everyone talks about, like, the main character energy. Obviously, that's, like, a new, like, recent trend thing 
but it like is scary to be the minor character in your own story in your own life oh my god i think i need to recover and then i can talk to you because holy jesus it's that and then this is the end when he says a lot get busy living or get busy dying and andy had that hope and like perseverance for himself but he also becomes that for other people in his life mainly red okay i'm gonna go i'm gonna like relax my freaking forehead veins are crazy <laughs> oh my god okay it's not long later it's actually only a few minutes later as you can tell by my shirt not being dry but i just needed to collect myself collect my um emotions that was a wild ride oh <sighs> i need some water i don't want to get lipstick i don't even know what else i should say like, I don't know what else to say. I'm surprising myself by giving this five stars <laughs> because there's literally nothing else I could do after that. Like, what else would you want from me except to give that five stars? Yeah, this, uh, that, those last 30, 20, 30 pages just absolutely did it for me. They hit very aggressively, very forcefully, ruthlessly. They didn't hold back at all. Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank I always say end the Shawshank Redemption because the movie's called The Shawshank Redemption, but it's Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption. It's worth a read. It's worth a little life lesson. It's worth a little emotional punch. I will say, I think the movie still influenced certain things throughout my reading that made it a bit of a better experience. Like I think Morgan Freeman's casting as Red is perfection. I also think Tim Robbins casting as Andy is perfection um, and neither of them are necessarily how their characters were described obviously Morgan Freeman more so but Andy is described as like short and skinny and small and really like slight while a uh, not Andy Tim Robbins is really tall he's a substantial man he's not like big big or anything like that but he's like he's a tall guy but he encapsulates Andy so well like I could never picture anyone but him as Andy and a couple things I saw while looking into this video Shawshank specifically did not use Stephen King as a marketing tactic at all all because they wanted it to stand on its own one but also to stand in a more prestigious prestigious light and not be associated with Stephen King's horror pulpy stories fiction and like other movies horror is lowbrow horror is not high class or prestige horror is not worthy of academy awards which obviously I don't agree with. They intentionally separated themselves from the, the thoughts that come with hearing Stephen King's name, with the Stephen King name and stuff like that. That's one thing. And another thing is that it's one of Stephen King's favorite adaptations of his books, which makes sense. It's like a very faithful adaptation. Like a, it is a faithful adaptation. It's like almost exactly the book to a movie. Anyway, this is going on too long. I'm talking way too much about this book. I was not expecting to talk so much or to feel so much. But I mean, that's the end of this video and the end of me. Did I finish the Shawshank Redemption or did it finish me? I think it finished me. I guess we'll say, I guess when we think about it, the books that I read just got better as I read them. So Psycho was just a fun little thriller moment. It was very easy, very chill. The movie was okay. Like I honestly thought I was gonna like it more than I did. Jurassic Park was really good and I really enjoyed it. This is not a five star read. <laughs> Five star reads are just different. Five stars are just different. It's a different rating, okay? It's like a 4.5. I really enjoyed it. I think it is practically a perfect book. So it could technically be like five stars in like a practicality thing. But for some reason, I always have to think about it personally. And Shawshank is five stars somehow, even though I was not really that obsessed in the beginning. That ending, you just can't end a story like that and expect it to not stick with me like that's just the fact that i was still crying so much after finishing it and like talking about it i'm gonna have, i have to rewatch the movie i have nothing else to say so bye